together we're here to have a conversation about the topic of medical cannabis and what it means to have access and the choice to this wonderful plant. I am here with Medwell Health and Wellness uh, as well as a group of guests and uh, in just a short moment they'll go ahead and invite them uh, and introduce themselves um, as well as who they're representing and really give some insight from uh, an industry perspective as well as a community perspective as to what it means to have access and the choice to medicate with a plant known as cannabis. So we want to thank uh, all of our guests are being here. We also would like to thank Milford TV um, and the incredible team, this incredible space for having us here. We're very, very thankful. We sincerely thank uh, the, the residents of Milford and uh, anyone who supports this uh, TV station. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, go ahead and move on to introducing this wonderful woman on my left hand side, which would be Ashlyn. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you to give us a little insight as to who you are and where you're from. So I'm Ashlyn Plunkett. I am business development for Sierra Naturals. I'm originally um, from the Hershey area, but now I live in Hockington, so right around the corner from our Milford production facility. Awesome, that's exciting. So Milford production meaning cultivation of? Correct, so it's our, so it's our cultivation, where we cultivate the cannabis, as well as um, manufacture, package, produce, um, it's where all the MIPS are created, the extraction products. Excellent. And MIPS meaning marijuana infused product? Correct. Okay. So if you're going to hear the term marijuana, you may also hear us talk about it as cannabis. And we'll get into that in a little bit today as well. Um, thank you, Ashlyn, for the quick little intro. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Miss Beth. Hi, I'm Beth Dost, and I'm a cannabis nurse. I'm generally considered the first nurse to stand for the use of medical cannabis um, in Massachusetts. I am speaking here on behalf of Medwell Health, and uh, I am their chief clinical officer, and I also serve as a senior executive consultant to the industry. Most notably, I do work as the clinical director for the Mass Patients Advocacy Alliance. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Kate. Hello, my name is Kate Phillips. I am the dispensary manager for Theory Wellness. We are a boutique cannabis dispensary uh, found in Bridgewater as well as Great Barrington. Um, I've previously worked a variety of roles in the industry uh, with primarily my background being in clinical health science. Very good. And I just want to confirm, so Sierra has a few locations. We do. Um, we operate in Cambridge, Somerville, and Needham. Excellent. And then we have Theory that has a few, lo a couple of locations. Yep, uh, a little bit more on the outskirts. Uh, we have one more, if you actually look on the map, near your Brockton location, and then a secondary location near the Pitts Field in Western Mass. Very nice. Um, okay. Barrington. Thank you, ladies. So uh, I just want to give a little, take this opportunity to give a little quick overview of why we're here today. And clearly, medical cannabis has brought us all together, thankfully. Um, and we, I just like to say, like we all have come from different backgrounds and different industries that have certainly translated into us being where we are now in the medical cannabis industry. So I'm really excited to show, get, provide a look and feel for those viewers at home that you know it's it's not it's just like any other industry. It's very highly regulated. Uh, it's very uh, safe and. The Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the Cannabis Control Commission will be uh, taking over the program in December. They're scheduled to take over the program in December. So we will see you know, how that goes. But for now, we have this program, and that's what's brought us all together. So I'm very, very thankful. And thank you for your time for coming here today. A little bit of what we're going to be touching upon. It's going to be pretty comprehensive, but I still would like to take the moment to tap on and or plant the seed into these certain topics, um, including, you know, why medical cannabis, uh, a little brief overview of cannabis prohibition, also known as the Marijuana Tax Act of mm -hmm. 1937, um, and the differences between uh, marijuana, cannabis, and hemp. Uh, we'd also like to a little bit uh, touch a little bit upon the topic of the endocannabinoid system. Uh, it can sound a little, you know, uh, long term, but really it's a wonderful uh, system that helps mammals to maintain balance, and it's 
it's why cannabis works so well on a physiological level. Uh, we'd also like to discuss the methods of administration because a lot of people tend to think it's, you know, you're just sitting there and you, you're inhaling it mostly when people think about cannabis. But now there is a wide range of methods of administration that in many conventional settings, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much anything that you can uh, have access to in a conventional healthcare system is you can find it as a cannabis infused product. So everything from plant material to a suppository to uh, sublingual applications, uh, inhalers, infused inhalers. So it's just it just is wonderful. So it's beyond just inhalation. It's beyond just you know the the, the doobies and you know calling it Mary Jane. There's real therapeutic properties to this beautiful sacred plant. So I'm excited to talk about that. We'll also talk about the benefits of becoming a medical pa patient and what that means in this emerging adult use market mm -hmm. uh, and specifically when it comes to Massachusetts so that will be an interesting conversation and specifically um, when it comes to the benefits of being a medical patient I want to talk about the uh, uh, to touch upon the duration the onset so the different products that offer different relief for different conditions that is our intention is to bring some level of, of confidence to you all and have you be um, informed so We'll go ahead and move on to a little brief history of medical cannabis. Uh, and I'm gonna direct this a little bit with Miss Beth. And uh, we know that there was the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. That's right. And yeah. that it was pretty politically charged and it was pretty kind of slightly racist. Yes. And there was, a lot, <laughs> and there yes. was a lot of money and politics uh, involved in this yes. propaganda of uh, really removing it from being known as cannabis and then transferring it to being known as marijuana and removing it from the pharmacopoeia and one thing after another. Right. So just to, you know, quickly touch upon that because we all know that cannabis was used as medicine prior to the Marijuana Tax yes. Act of 1937 as shown here and one one example of a bottle here. So anyone born prior to that, they're probably already being given this by their mothers, their grandmothers, mm -hmm. and it was in every physician's bag. That's right. And um, the thing that's very interesting is for anybody that's watching that was born before 1940, you probably have and possess a rich endocannabinoid system, which we're going to discuss, I think, in our conversation. And that undoubtedly is because, in some part, you were given cannabis as an infant or a child. It was included in many, many preparations. It was widely accepted. It was first used, I mean, it's used dates back, I had just recently read 9,000 years, but we know that the Chinese first used it about 3,000 years ago. And uh, so, uh, anyway, what happened was prohibition ended against alcohol and cannabis sales it didn't rebound the way that the investors in New York thought that it would. Cannabis had been brought into the, into the country. Uh, there were many fields in the Deep South uh, where it was vilified and there was a lot of racist element to it. Marijuana with the Mexicans bringing in cannabis, the Chinese bringing in poppy. And um, when this, the tax act went through, it had been on the pharmacopoeia, which meant that it was legitimate to physicians and pharmacists at the time. Its uh, use was well known, well documented. They didn't know why it worked, but it worked. And uh, it's an adaptogen. So it works with people as people travel, and as the plant travels, the plant adapts not only to its environment, but to the people that use it. And it sounds like a little bit as hemp would also be as That's far right. as now we know cannabis as medicine, it was used in yes. tinctures and preparations yes. already, and there was also hemp, which is yes. less than trace amounts of THC agriculturally yep. mm -hmm. used for all sorts of product. That's right, and so when there is Dr. Ethan Russo, who's a very famous researcher in the cannabis field, 
has postulated that we are all suffering, the uptick in chronic disease is because we are all suffering from an endocannabinoid deficiency, and he actually calls it the endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. And that is because when they went about destroying the cannabis or the marijuana, they also destroyed the hemp. The hemp fed our animals, our animals fed us, and uh, it was taken out of the grains, and therefore, we did not boost our endocannabinoid system with plant materials. Right, so the feed that our animals were getting, and That's so that right. was like eggs, and we had the, the milk, and milk and any kind of product. Any right. kind of product. That so we were already getting cannabinoids right. into it. So a That's little right. bit about cannabinoids would be that the cannabis plant produces these chemical compounds known as, identified as cannabinoids. That's so right. when you hear the term cannabinoids, that's what we're referring to are these yeah. active ingredients, let's say, that the plant produces and is responsive within our own system. That's right. And we produce our own cannabinoids. So everybody that's watching this program and all of us here in this room produce our own cannabinoids. We have an internal pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And um, what we, with the, his theory is that once they took it out of our food source, what did they replace it with? GMOs. And of course, cotton was a big industry during World War II, and cotton competed with hemp. Hemp was used industrially for ropes, for textiles, et cetera. When hemp was taken out of use, it was replaced with plastics. So we had cannabis, which is this lovely little plant that if anyone was to see it, it looks somewhat like a tomato plant. It was vilified. Uh, because it uh, was at the wrong place at the wrong time, and then poli uh, politics took over. And then in the 60s and 70s, during the Vietnam era, the Woodstock era, um, what happened was they didn't really know how to schedule it nor what to do with it. Because at that point, they didn't really know um, how they, they just knew that when heated, it had an intoxicating effect. And uh, at that point, Nixon just decided to throw it in with the war on drugs, and it became designated in Schedule One. Mm. And when it became designated in Schedule One, along with heroin um, and other uh, very dangerous drugs, as we all know, um, uh, it we've had a terrible time getting it out of it, a Schedule One, which has created this clash between the federal government and the states. Mm -hmm. So yes. tincture was really a great, uh, well, typically those preparations prior to 1937 was typically of a tincture uh, method, which right. is in a high grain alcohol or mm -hmm. of a high f oil, fat content of oil, let's say. Right. And uh, it was sublingually applied, it was normal, it was yeah. not stigmatized the way that it is now, so let it be known that it's not like reefer madness. Nice and it's, it's not real, so uh, we can, all of us have had personal experiences with patients who have benefited from have an access and the choice to find relief with this plant. I think you're calmed down. So quickly. Isn't that amazing? He used just a single drop and his hands afterwards were rock steady and the dyskinesia left. Who mm -hmm. was coming back? It works most of the time. In fact, it's... Uh... <laughs> And if you could take a moment and have a conversation with a patient that's benefiting, it would truly touch your heart and really give you a different perspective and a mindset uh, when it comes to this plant. So we encourage you to um, open your heart and open your mind to others who are finding relief uh, with this, this plant that's <laughs> It replaces a lot of pharmaceuticals. Well, and so. just to re remind you and to remind everybody that Schedule One actually means it has no medical value. So we all know now, indisputably, 
it has medical value. There's been a, the so data many is studies. There. The data is overwhelming. Right. I think what's so, important to realize about that too, though, is that it creates barriers for research. So yes. when it's in a Schedule One classification, at that point in time, when you try to move it to make it able for different universities um, to look into its medicinal benefits or maybe what it can and can't do. Um, it, it really, you're not able to have much flexibility with that at that point in time. Yes, and, and part of the destruction of plant medicine or the devaluation of plant medicine ushered in the pharmaceutical age. And as the pharmace pharmaceutical age was ushered in, big money fo fo followed big pharma. Mm. And so we couldn't also, I'm sure, comment on that. But, you know, that's just pertaining mostly to the states. When it comes to uh, cannabis in the world as medicine, it's it's already being well studied, documented mm -hmm. in yeah. clinical phase two trials in countries such as Israel, Canada. And so they're ahead of it when it comes to it. Uh, but the conversation has to start somewhere. So I'm, I'm like, thankful that we're here and we get to have this sort of conversation. Uh, thankfully to the voters who, you know, voted this program into um, for those in the Commonwealth to have access in 2012. And we know that it was passed by over 66% on the ballot. So uh, that's wonderful that we have, I believe it's called the Humanitarian Act for mm -hmm. um, the use of medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it took about three years or so for us to have our first uh, registered marijuana dispensary that opened up in Salem. And then the second one to open up in Brockton, which is the one I used to work at. And um, I got to really have the experience and the exposure of patients and this is when our patients in the state was at about probably less than 20,000 and right now we have about 50,000 patients in the program uh, which is really marginally small compared to other states that have uh, a medical program in there so these sort of conversations will definitely help facilitate making this a normal option for relief for sure uh, so leading into kind of the research, uh, the endocannabinoid system, just to, in lay's terms, like a really like 60 second kind of that, that those in the community can understand and share in a credible way with their friends and family. So the endocannabinoid system is found in all mammals. And if you think of it as uh, it is the largest modulator in the system, in your body, and the purpose of the endocannabinoid system is to restore balance, and home which is called homeostasis. And so if you think of your body and uh, its function, you know, when it gets out of whack, the endocannabinoid system tries to bring in balance. And if you think of it, it, there are two receptors, two main receptors, CB1 and CB2. CB1 is in the brain, the spinal cord, most organs. CB2 is in things like the adrenal system, the parasympathetic, the sympathetic nervous system. And all these symptoms are, all these systems are essential for the running of your body. Um, when, if you think of it, think of it as a series of chains. And it's all over your body and that when there is a disruption or a missing link in that chain, your internal cannabinoids fill that. If you do not have enough internal cannabinoids, the endocannabinoid system perfectly interacts with the plant. And so when you ingest the plant ma uh, matter, it seeks out and finds those missing links, which is why cannabis works so well in so many disease states. Mm -hmm. And that's my 60 second. <laughs> Excellent. And you said mammals yes, too. Yes. So All we have mammals, so we see veterinarians using it. I just had, I did a little consultation on a little doggy that was having seizures and they're going to try CBD with a little THC under the tongue in a tincture. And so all mammals um, have possess the endocannabinoid system. Excellent, I know, <laughs> uh, you know, full disclosure, my little puggle Hendrix, who's about to be 12, he's 12 years old, he was on a long regimen of Rimadol, Tramadol, and uh, Gabapentin for post-acute uh, neck surgery uh, and um, a little arthritis. And we've successfully reduced his 
uh, we're, we're, and then it's about, about a year and a half as well, reduced him being on those meds long term. Um, at the time of his procedure too, they found a, a malignancy on his thyroid which was removed and they did determine he has malignancy but uh, they gave him about six months to live and he's you know a year and a half out for a little 12 year old buck and uh, we provide him daily therapeutic doses of uh, what's known as a one-to-one -one equal ratios of CBD THC um, extraction oil a whole sp uh, plant spectrum uh, oil ethanol extracted known as um, decarboxylated oil Rick Simpson oil and it's provided him great relief, great improvement on quality of life, and I'm not quite sure that all those long-term meds and chemo radiation would have provided him the same quality of life. So I'm pumped. Mammals have access. It's not just for humans. It should absolutely be a viable option for animals without a doubt. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I can see that. So thank you for that little info on that. I'd like to move into a little bit about products and when we say products, we're talking about different ways that uh, those patients can consume or apply the cannabis medicine. So I would like to um, ask if Ashlyn could speak a little bit about, you know, your, probably your more popular products when it comes to ingesting it, um, as well as, and we'll, that will lead us on to like duration and onset and the benefit of those type of products. but. Like some of your best, uh, I don't want to say best sellers, but the patients that are benefiting the most from specific products when it comes to an edible or uh, an infused product that you would eat or consume. So yeah, we offer a number of infused products um, for patients that choose to you know, take their therapeutic medicine that way. Um, I would say that one of our, you know, most popular products for people using it for, you know, using cannabis therapy is our tincture. Um, we do have a THC tincture, a one-to-one, -one, as well as a full CBD, which is all extracted from the plants that we grow at our production facility and our, you know, cultivation. In Milford. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, so that comes in two flavors. We have just the original plain flavor and then also cinnamon for people that, you know, would like it to come with a little bit of flavor. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a very popular product for people. Um, and then of course some people would prefer to take it with a little bit of a sweet. So it's, um, we do offer brownies as well as uh, Zoot Rocks. So they're just little uh, lozenges. We have cinnamon, uh, Zoot Berry, and also a um, caramel flavor. So the difference of ingesting it, eating it, versus the sublingual tincture application so that the so, suits are in a package, the correct. tincture comes in what kind of packaging? So the tincture comes in a dropper bottle. Okay. Um, and so the difference between you know those two methods of, of uh, intake would be that when you consume something, an edible, it has to go through your digestive system um, before it's absorbed, whereas a tincture sublingually um, generally will get into your system quicker via your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Excellent, I love those entry products so mm -hmm. that the sibling will can, you'll identify and establish a tolerance a little more quickly as opposed to when you're ingesting the product, it can. It can take, uh, you know. It can vary of how yeah. an individual will respond to it because each of us have a very beautiful individual endocannabinoid That's system mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. our system receives it, regulates it, and distributes the, the um, cannabinoids is very unique and subjective to each of us, which is beautiful mm -hmm. to know. Um, all right, that's, that's wonderful to know. Now, when it comes to inhalation methods, Kate, uh, what would be some of the, when, and when we refer to flower, we're it, referring to the? So we're talking about the raw cannabis. This would be when you come to Theory, we weigh the product out in front of you, so you get to see these nice little cookie jars filled with your cannabis. Um, the great thing about cannabinoid medicine and therapy is you really choose your experience. You choose how you want to feel. Um, intoxication is not the only way that you can experience cannabis. And I think that's a commonly misunderstood um, part of what we do. And you know, there are plenty of people that are very familiar with smoking cannabis the original way. You know, they have a bowl at home that they enjoy. It's part of their wind down process at night. Uh, as well as we do have other people that come for our more concentrated products, also known as extracts. Um, I explain it to patients, it's kind of like your espresso versus your cup of coffee, which would be your joint or your bowl. And it's a way to be able to take a lot of the plant matter out of it and still get a really, um, not necessarily accelerated, although sometimes um, experience, but also a concentrated experience in a shorter period of time. 
this would be great for people that are struggling with more severe symptoms and need more medicine in a shorter period of time, um, as well as people that are looking for kind of varying experiences or to layer different types of medications um, to be able to kind of fill in the gaps that would be need. So continuity of relief, essentially. Absolutely. I mean, the goal that I always tell patients when they come to our facility is we want to find you the smallest amount of medicine that can help you the most and understand that pain and symptoms is a range. And we want to be able to find products that can really support you at any point in time during those phases, mm -hmm. um, as well as understanding your own endocannabinoid system mm -hmm. uh, and being able to really plan out your day so that you're not being interrupted in the middle of your work day and having to go out and take a vape break if that doesn't work for your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to take a capsule that's you know eight hours worth of relief for some patients, other patients can be four to six. And again, um, it's all a process and understanding yourself. You're taking a lot of the power out of the doctor, giving the prescription and telling you how to feel and really putting the person back in touch with their own experiences um, and understanding that that's your truth. And mm -hmm. We use that information going forward to make the best decisions we can for your yeah, I love it. It's, it's an empowerment. It really elicits the individual's own balancing response. And a lot of that you have to be conscious of, about and like totally fully engaged. So I love that aspect when we see people or patients that are beginning their journey with the plant and establishing their relationship with the plant. So I'm a super fan of that. Uh, when you were talking about concentrates, so as far as, I mean, I know you mentioned vape pens. Cause I think yeah. most of the community is aware of the plant material, but as far as vape pens, a little difference of, of yeah. inhaling the plant material versus inhaling a processed yeah. extraction or concentrate or hash oil or... Yeah, so there's a couple things you're gonna hear called as. Um, typically, you know, for theory specifically, we do a CO2 extract. Um, typically when you're wondering about what type of concentrate you're going to do, you're also wanting to know the process and the materials used to create it. Um, some other dispensaries use things like ethanol, some places use butane. Um, each one is going to have a very different type of underlining flavor as well as maybe a different style of effect. And it also goes to speak about the consistency and the quality of the product overall. So um, when we use the CO2, we don't use any cuts or fillers. That's also a common industry practice. Um, so either using botanically derived terpenes, terpenes are the fragrant essential oils found inside cannabis. They um, are really responsible for the variety of effects that you can feel where the cannabinoids typically provide the framework of the experience. And once you're playing around with those, you're gonna have very different effects from something that is a high THC content and added terps versus a more well-blended, uh, more full extract cannabinoid oil that's extracted the way through. Not to say that there's anything wrong with either one. They just have very different effects and they can be beneficial for very different types of people and conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as far as our concentrates, we do the pre-filled pens, which is a really great option. This is for patients that are looking for something discreet, maybe not as smelly um, or obvious for daily use. Again, people that are kind of looking to get in, get what they need yeah. and get out. Um, so it, much more powerful than plant material. You're looking at yeah. anywhere from two to four times compared to an inhalation of your plant mm -hmm. material. And if you were to experience an inhalation of a pre-filled vape pen or also known as a cartridge, you're gonna probably want to experiment at a much lower dose at a lower rate and a lower yeah. inhalation I mean, Wait. always asking um, your, you know, bud tender, we also call them uh, patient treatment associates or cannabis consultants. Um, ask the people behind the counter when you're going to these places, ask them how they make it, ask them how it might make you feel. Um, really set yourself up with the best possible scenario by arming yourself with these answers from the facility that you're buying them from, um, as well as learning more about them when you go home. Uh, you know, with these pens, they can be really wonderful, like we said, but absolutely when you're moving from something like a combustible product or a actual joint to a pen, you really want to make sure you're taking like a one to three second hit. Mm -hmm. We always tell people, you know, to suck, We say inhale. hey, you mean inhalation. Yes, right. inhalation. Inhale, yeah. Um, more colloquial I mean, we're, terms. We're going to get on the terms <laughs> real good here. Um, but when we're moving to something like that, you know, taking that one to three second inhale, taking a full breath, exhaling, and waiting to see how you feel, not immediately taking a secondary inhalation or right. moving forward, um, really kind of touching base with how you feel, give it a couple minutes, you know, and then decide, is it right for you to continue moving forward? Yeah, and that's a great conscious cannabis uh, 
patient right there when you are taking a moment. And a lot of your dis a lot of these registered marijuana dispensaries um, also provide a patient handbook um, and a lot log. of printed materials. It has a, a log in there for you to, other than using your iPhone, that you can use another resource that is provided by dispensaries in the state. Uh, so that's, and not every dispensary is going to carry similar products. So some dispensaries may carry a particular product that best suits your condition. And uh, so you're going to want to do your due diligence. You want to hop on their website, look at their menu. Inventory tends to come on and off quite quickly. Uh, and some dispensaries will carry like a, a particular product for inhalation versus uh, topical versus uh, a, a prepared. Um, infused products so just to keep that in mind and help you be more informed we will post a link with uh, the information of how to find all the registered marijuana dispensaries here in Massachusetts. I just wanted to say one thing yes. about um, the methods of administration. I hear um, from time to time and quite often uh, that you know concern about gummies and inhalation and tinctures or um, just uh, somewhat of a um, negative slant is put on the different uh, methods of administration. And I just want to say as a nurse with many, many, many years of experience, um, we as nurses and we as healthcare professionals and parents, uh, you know, prenatal vitamins are in gummies. Meds are crushed up and put in applesauce. Inhalation therapy works very well as bronchodilation and um, inhalers are a spray and an inhale. So it's really not that different from traditional administration of medication. Uh, the fact that it's plant material, it can be extracted and baked in a brownie, which actually it might be perfect for that person who is using cannabis to gain weight. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very versatile plant. And I think that that's really one of the things that's very, that's really awesome about the plant is that it can be given in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And any responsible person is going to make sure that their medication is kept out of reach of small mm -hmm. children and that they're going to take care of their um, medicine cabinet and are encouraged to do so routinely um, on TV. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of wanted to say that a little bit. I, I don't really agree with the criticism that the various administration methods get and I think that if we think everything that's powerful is in a capsule, I can tell you I have broken many capsules and mixed it in ice cream or a drink or applesauce for administration to patients in healthcare institutions. Mm -hmm. So right, and it doesn't have to be your traditional sweet either. They do many dispensaries do produce even product that has infused butter, infused olive yeah, oil. So right. to meet every dietary restriction there is, whether you're lactose intolerant, whether right. uh, you can't do food dye, and or like you can't like or an, an allergy to tree nuts. Mm -hmm. There's so many. There's so many different ways to have access and get this medicine into your system and have relief now. There's no need to suffer. If you're not finding relief in other avenues, like please consider cannabis as medicine. Like, I think please. it's also important to understand you can enjoy the process. This is now something that, you know, instead of taking capsule at the end of the night, you're taking your melatonin and you want to switch to cannabinoid therapy. You can eat a little brownie before you go to bed. Or oh. if you want to wake up in the morning and you want to put on a transdermal, you want to use a topical or an infused salve instead of taking, you know, again, an inhalation or mm -hmm. a gummy. Um, it's totally your choice. And mm -hmm. the benefits of those edibles, you know, having a heavy fat content inside edibles protects the cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. It helps uh, extend the duration of the effect. It can also delay the onset, but you know, there are ways to play those things to your advantage as a patient to be able to get your desired effects. Mm -hmm. I just wanna quickly tap, like full disclosure, so there's no national accredited standard when it comes to cannabis training, uh, cannabis therapeutics. It's, it's just really non-existent as far as a formal uh, certified program. So a lot of our experience uh, outside of 
you know, uh, outside of other industries is from patient testimonial, from patient feedback, from literally talking to thousands of patients, in addition to reading and looking at the data that's out there and talking to other professionals, um, what, what the research is saying. But I, I, just to let you know, like this full disclosure, we're hearing a lot of the feedback from patients and we're given, certainly giving them the benefit of the doubt as we can clearly see improvement literally from coming in a wheelchair to improvement going into, now coming into a walker and then, so literally physically with improving their ambulatory functions to improving their mood, uh, the quality of life improvement is just outstanding. So just to keep that in, in mind that it's it's definitely a thing like you got to give it a go yourself. But I do want to talk a little bit about Sierra's products as far as topicals are concerned. And I know that tincture can also be applied. It's activated, so if you needed to, you could fit, like literally apply it and have an effect and relief. But as far as like a salve or topical application is concerned, so we don't currently offer that product in our stores today. Um, but they are definitely in R and D. We are actively. Um, trying to make the best product possible um, before we make it available to our patients. So Excellent. we'll have it, you know, at some point soon. Um, but like I said, we're just trying to perfect it before we. Before okay. We bring it back. What are some of the options for a topical? Would you are you seeing right now? And oh my gosh, I mean, well, there's lotions. There's like you said, salves, which are more of like a, um, you know, a. Like a concentrated denser, cream. Yeah, yeah, concentrated creams, mm -hmm. um, and also patches. I think you could consider that a topical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those can be put on a specific area. Um, so I would consider that a topical. Well. So the difference between like a, a topical that's mm -hmm. not formulated to go through all the layers of the skin, mm -hmm. enter the blood, break the blood brain barrier and have a systemic effect like a transdermal patch has mm -hmm. this formulation so that it will be absorbed and you will, no matter if you apply the patch to your ankle mm -hmm. or wherever, you're, you're going to feel the effect throughout your whole body and that tends to be yeah. more of a long-term relief as opposed to the topical, mm -hmm. which is usually intended for local uh, temporary relief. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I'm excited. I look forward to seeing yeah. some of that product. Yeah. It's a great, Exciting. great product. So for someone who's applying it locally, for the most part, they're not going to be, they're not going to feel a systemic effect, even if it was pure THC. No. And they'd have to that eat the product. True. They'd have to eat the product. Uh, what um, cannabis tends to do is it doesn't go down uh, real far for, uh, into the dermis. It does go down and is absorbed. Uh, what I have found and what patients have told me is that they generally tend to put it on areas of pain or discomfort. And uh, much like the smart, uh, cannabinoids are smart, and they go to that the endocannabinoid system would have that chain would be in those links would be in that area and so if you were to put it on you had arthritis or what there's a disruption there and remember this is looking to restore homeostasis it senses that there is a disruption it actually knows there is because neuromodulation and but we kept it at a 60 second easy <laughs> and so uh, so it's much more complex than that but it tends to stay where the discomfort or where the problem is. It knows that is where it is. And I have had people report that they actually will feel um, an increase in heat, especially if it's pain, where they apply the topical. So uh, it's very interesting in how smart the plant is in interacting with our endocannabinoid system. My kind of plant. Yep. <laughs> all right, so I would like to just kind of ask you all as I, go over the method, methods of administration, just kind of share the benefits of that um, administration when it comes to duration, onset, uh, and the ease of using it. So let's talk about uh, prepared edibles. So the benefits of prepared edibles. Convenient, Can we, great, mm -hmm. tasty. <laughs> Super tasty. You can get multiple doses in one specific product. Um, sometimes, depending on the facility, they might have a 50 pack of something, where you just take one gummy and that's your dose. Other ones, you might have five gummies in a pack that you might be able to cut up further. Um, so usually, a lot of the dispensaries make it pretty easy to be able to divide those up. 
Yep. Now the onset is looking at, for most people generally, uh, they're going to feel it within 45 minutes to a couple of hours I mean, maybe? It can take up to two hours, so I think yeah. that everybody should always go with the policy, you know, low, low, and, low slow. and slow. We don't want people repeating their dose until they know what they've, the result of the dosing. So you really need to wait a full six hours, I think, to really get an idea of what you're going to get from an edible. Would you, would you not agree? Before, yeah. You would never yeah. want to repeat your dose before that because yeah. you have to assume that you're going to feel something. Unless, and then you go up from there. Mm -hmm. Start low. Yeah, yeah and like slow. a standard dose for someone who's initially identifying and experimenting with cannabis as medicine for an infused product, a prepared product that you're going to be eating and going through your, being metabolized by your liver, we're looking at, you know, anywhere between two and a half to five mm -hmm. milligrams mm -hmm. is a safe dose. Mm -hmm. Many individuals can be super sensitive and they're like, a two is Absolutely. so good for me. And if I you mean, know you're chemically sensitive, you know, there are products like tinctures that could be even half of one milligram. You know, take that advantage of that product and really use it to the best of your safe ability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can never take product back after you took it, but you can really control. I'd rather have nothing happen than have a negative experience and potentially, yeah. you know, ruin the ability for, for you to really explore this further as a medicine. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that um, as we're talking about, you know, packaged products or marijuana infused products um, that we're talking about first timers, I think that that's one of the greatest benefits of that particular administration is that for someone who's new to cannabis therapy, I think it's the least intimidating way to, to take it, mm -hmm. you know, to, mm -hmm. to see, you know, what their experience is going to be like mm -hmm. and how it can benefit them personally. But I think it's also important to notice that, you know, not everybody starts off with a two and a half to five milligram tolerance. That's not the standard dose for a lot of patients. Um, myself, I'm very happy from the 20 to 60 range, depending mm -hmm. on the day. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've got plenty of friends that start 200 and above, and that's due to a variety of reasons. But again, this is understanding your individual body, understanding how you process cannabinoids and what works for you. Right, and the condition and the symptoms that you're trying to relieve and manage, right. Exactly, and you know, touching back to the topicals, and you did a lovely job explaining mm -hmm. the chains and links. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, using that layering, using multitude of levels to be able to get your desired effects. Right, and that's leading mm -hmm. me to the next thing, is that you, when you eat cannabis or a prepared product, regardless of how long it's going to take effect, for the most part, it tends to, you're, the patient tends to feel the relief from anywhere from four to maybe even as long as eight hours. Mm -hmm. And that's only when you're being, you know, potentially psychoactively, you know, affected by it or feeling that very pronounced difference. But, you know, having any sort of cannabinoids in your system and the way I always explain this to patients is, whatever way you can get it in the beginning is totally great. And, you know, we can work our way up from there. But mm -hmm. to be able to have that small amount of cannabinoids is just supporting your body systems mm -hmm. and in wonderful ways, so. Yep, upregulated as it's known. <laughs> and then the tincture would be different from a prepared edible because mm -hmm. it's being sublingually applied, but for most patients, they can tend to feel the effects of that tincture or that dose within as soon as five minutes to 20 minutes. I mean, I think that's just a personal experience for people as well, so it's hard yeah. to say. I mean, I think it could generally be, you know, be felt sooner, but. Yeah, Com again, in comparison so. to a prepared product that your stomach is metabolizing mm -hmm. in the liver. Well, is... yeah, I think that uh, a sublingual, if you think about patients that take nitroglycerin, they're supposed to have relief within three minutes, and if it, they have no relief, they take another one, and if they have no relief, they take a third, and if they have no relief, then they go to the hospital. But, typically, and I'm not advising that, do what your doctor says. <laughs> I'm just using this as an example, and, um, and, it, and so sublingual is supposed to be a rapid onset. Um, and if you don't feel it very quickly, it it's not doesn't hurt to then try maybe half of what you used under your tongue because your, re, your response is going to be fairly quick. I like to encourage patients to start really with vaping initially. And the only reason why is because they can take a very small sip of a, vapor, of a vaporizer and they know within four minutes it, exactly how they're going to feel. Mm -hmm. And it's going to last about two hours. So if they're uncomfortable 
And I also encourage patients to have like a syringe of CBD. And CBD can sometimes offset mm -hmm. if they have a bad experience from a vape pen. But if you want to know quickly how, and maybe some of the younger patients want to know quickly if they suffer from migraines or severe pain or um, discomfort and they want a rapid onset, the quickest way to know how you're going to react, and of course I think interaction with the staff at the dispensaries, mm -hmm. and maybe even starting with that ratio mm -hmm. of one to one, so the intoxicating effect doesn't sort of overwhelm them. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, is it very just important? to explain, you know, one-to-one mm -hmm. -one products, when CBD and THC are in equal amounts, they counteract each other's psychoactivity. So CBD known as the non-psychoactive, THC known as the psychoactive or the high part of cannabis. Mm -hmm. So when you have those one-to-one -one products, that's the safest bet for patients across the board. Um, you know, and it's a great potential place to start. for yes. the potential of the therapeutic value as well, by having yeah. those ratios available potentially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we know uh, inhalation, we know sublingual, we know ingesting it. We understand topical uh, is not really going to have a systemic effect, but great for conditions like neuropathy. Neuropathy arthritis. is arthritis. <laughs> Even topical conditions like skin conditions. Psoriasis. Yes. I know skin conditions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Psoriasis, eczema, Even eczema. Just, um, general you know, contact dermatitis in general, you know, cannabis is antimicrobial, antibacterial, antifungal, anti-everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can really put that, you know, I explain to people if you're in the woods, you gotta concentrate, you gotta wound, be the most expensive band-aid you ever put on, but it would work really well. Right. Um, so, you know, it cannabis burns, is, there, it's excellent <laughs> right. if you have a little salve around, if you have a burn, uh, promotes very quick healing. Mm -hmm. And studies now are starting to show that it has um, a youthful effect on the skin. So it's very interesting that as we move into this, we're going to see more skincare lines mm -hmm. than we're already seeing mm -hmm. because there, the research is starting to show that it has that youthful effect on the skin. I think it produ increases production of collagen and it repairs damage to the skin because once again, the endocannabinoid system looks to restore homeostasis. If skin is damaged, then the skin is out of balance and so it tends to restore that balance. And I know we tapped a little bit about the concentrates, extractions, or oils, and there's two, categorically, you have oil that you can inhale, or um, and that's not fully activated, and it requires some kind of heat to uh, make it fully medicinal or therapeutic, and then you have this side where it's um, fully activated and ready to be consumed and eaten. So uh, also known as an ethanol extract and or a, um, either it's using a high grain alcohol for extraction uh, or however it's being prepared, but that product you can eat and you'll probably hear the term RSO, Rick Simpson oil. FICO, um, FICO. full extract cannabis oil. Um, also you might hear like full spectrum extract. That's just referring to a whole plant extract using the entire plant, not just isolating one of those compounds like THC, CBD, et cetera. So just to like, we don't want to skip over that at all. And then the last thing is I want to mention the benefits of suppositories. So in my former role at uh, the registered marijuana dispensary, we were the first or at the time, we were um, the first to carry that product, and we did see a lot of patients benefiting from having access that uh, wanted the bioavailability of the product within their system, and they were treating some pretty severe um, life-limiting illnesses, including anything to do lower, lower pelvic, uh, carcinoma in the lower pelvic, uh, female, um, female different conditions, PCOS, Polycystic ovarian system mm -hmm. syndrome was a big condition. They were looking relief uh, for endometriosis, endometriosis. Yep. even diverticulitis, Crohn's, colitis, IBD, IBS. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, that topical relief. Um, you know, if people are having issues with their digestive tract, you know, regardless, you know, again, females, we have two different options there. Um, you know, can be used for a variety of ways. And it's this body lightening sensation for most people. Mm -hmm. It's not a head high, as they call it. Um, so it's really a functioning 
you know, product that people are able to use. Right. And I would just like to reiterate, if you're looking for more of a functional entry uh, product, we would re it would be best. And what we, what I have found to be most useful and based on patient patient feedback is that it's uh, the the CBD rich cannabidiol rich product or cannabidiol, cannabidiol or CBD dominant product. So I would I would like to say something about that though because um, I have a chronic illness. I have chronic Lyme disease. Um, pretty similar as an autoimmune disorder to a lot of other people's, um, such as you know lupus, MS has very similar symptoms as well. And you know CBD isn't something that you're like, oh, it's non psychoactive. I'll just pop a 50 milligram nugget. No, please don't do that. Um, treat it just as the same as you would THC. For someone like myself, what it does is it creates a bottleneck of detoxification in my body, and it actually creates very uncomfortable effects. So again, important to understand your own self, understand how you respond to these things. And you know that with any cannabinoid therapy that you're really taking it slow and using it appropriately for your condition based off how you feel. Mm. So not just for acute life limiting, but also chronic relief, that's huge. Yeah. And not to, just because CBD is widely known and suggested to be of a non-intoxicating, there's still benefit to be received. Yeah. So that's wonderful to hear. Uh, I want to, before we run out of time, I do want to slightly talk about this emerging adult use market and the benefits of this having access to this medical market, uh, medical program here in Massachusetts. So with this emerging adult use market, we're looking at a couple of things like uh, there's definitely going to be shortages. Uh, and the medical program has instituted, and I believe was it the MPAA that helped yes. facilitate ensuring that 35% yes. of uh, inventory would be mandatory set aside for the medical program. And I, is that just for co-located RNDs, registered marijuana dispensaries that will be servicing both markets? It's actually, I believe, yes, and additionally, um, for cultivation and supply in totality. Okay. Because we don't understand, nor do we know, what, that our, what our supply will be when the adult use, we have to grow the plant. So up here, it's not even great to grow the plant. Colorado, when they went to the adult use market, in addition to their medical market, they sold out of all cannabis within, I think, three days. So, so we're we'll preventing that here. So we're preventing that yep. so that the last bud or uh, the last cannabis product does not go to a recreational or an adult use user. Okay. And so we have secured a 35% hold back across all product lines for the medical patients. Excellent. And so, uh, but I think that that says not only co-located, it's just everyone's available because you don't want co-located facilities to be holding back, they're down to their last 35%, and then um, not to have that spread around that, you know, all other um, dispensaries are also going to be uh, required to be served the medical patient. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, the taxes that will be, medical patients will not be required to pay, right. and uh, the adult use market will be paying upwards of 23% tax. So if you're a patient and you're on a regular regimen of, and you're looking for having continuity of relief, remaining a patient is, um, and or be becoming a patient is, uh, we highly uh, recommend visiting our website, learning about the medical use, um, the medical program here in Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, the benefits are in addition to 35% inventory and the, um, and the no taxes, right. there's also, you have access to a caregiver. So for someone who's non-ambulatory on palliative or hospice care, or for someone that's dealing with a condition like Lyme and it's more neurological, for example, sorry not to like, but well, yeah. the anxiety that can be so induced um, in that specific condition can really, you know, they, it just is way too much for them to come into one of our brick and mortar locations that we will come to them. So for those who can't leave, we will literally bring our provider, our medical assistant, our office to the patient and literally meet them where they are at, mind and body. So just to, the, in the, in, to have a caregiver, so for someone that can't leave, they're able to assign someone that can 
uh, essentially provide them the same legal protection in, pos in possession and access as a patient has. So they can go to the dispensary, um, pick up the order, or place an order, they can receive a delivery order, and they can help with the administration of the medicine. So the caregiver is huge. You're going to have purchasing limits. You're going to have potency limits in certain product. So uh, when you are a patient, these sort of limit, these sort of benefits of being a patient in the program in Massachusetts is essential. So uh, we recommend that we, um, you visit our website, become informed, visit our FAQ page. Also, Sierra and Theory's pages are hugely patient education um, focused. So we highly recommend uh, popping on their websites as well as the Massachusetts Patient Advocacy Alliance yeah. website when it comes to educating and informing yourself. As we're coming to a close here, we're going to take a moment just to uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you again to Milford TV. Rob and his team is incredible. So anyone and everyone that's supporting this organization, we totally uh, support it and sincerely appreciate it. It's it, wonderful. So I'd like to invite our guests to invite you of how you can find them. So I'll ask Kate to go in and start with that. You can find Theory Wellness on theorywellness.org, as well as find us on social media sites like Facebook and Instagram. Um, I also have a personal brand called Your Favorite Dab Mom. I teach cannabis educational classes outside of uh, work, so we do things a, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more off the cuff there. Nice. <laughs> but you can find me again on Facebook, Instagram, Your Favorite Dab Mom. Nice. Thank you. And then. Um, so, Sierra Naturals, we're at sierranaturals.org. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can visit us anytime at our Cambridge, Somerville, and Needham locations. Cambridge and Somerville are open from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., and Needham is 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Excellent. And it's just for medical marijuana or medical cannabis patients at this time. Correct. Correct. Yes, we will very much announce on all of our social media sites, all dispensaries, when we are open for adult use. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. And then here with uh, Medwell Health and Wellness, we are uh, have six brick and mortar locations here in the Commonwealth, including Mashpee, Lowell, Brookline, Somerville, Brockton, and Pittsfield. We also offer in-home consultations where we bring our services to meet the patient where they're at. And we also do on-site uh, pop-up clinics. So we've recently been on Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, New Bedford, really in underserved communities. We bring our services, we bring this sort of informational presentation together and provide a resource to a community near you. So uh, we're at medwellhealth.net. We're on all the social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, uh, as well as, uh, let's see, and I think that's pretty much it, into a community near you. So, and in closing, I'd like to go ahead and ask Beth, our uh, uh, here with Medwell, to close us up. Well, I just wanted to say you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, you can find the Mass Patients Advocacy Alliance on um, the on uh, the internet. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say uh, just uh, some closing statements. I have come to believe over the past seven years of doing cannabis medicine that the lack of available cannabis is one of our largest international health crises that we face. Um, I have seen tremendous um, relief and I have seen more suffering than I would ever like to remember. And so if you are a patient, if you do suffer, please seek out medical cannabis for some relief and we have a lot of beautiful, wonderful dispensaries. They're highly regulated. The department has had very exacting standards. We have a wonderful program here in Massachusetts. We have five statutory adjustments, which is unique to our state. We should be very proud of that all enacted by the voters and by patients. And um, in closing, I would just say that there's really no downside to the use of cannabis because cannabis interacts naturally with your endocannabinoid system. And so I'd like to take the fear out of cannabis. And um, as this emerging adult use market comes to bear, I would say that it is a safer, more um, palatable 
and um, a better alternative to alcohol. And we'll see how that all rolls out in the future. <laughs>